and welcome to a very festive edition of Reading Aloud. There'll be heroes, villains, and lots of fun as we explore the enduring appeal of the pantomime story. And as with all good pantos, there'll be a few surprises. Rats, rats, that's all anyone ever talks about these days. As we unwrap this giant Christmas present of reading delights for you and those you teach. Coming up, we'll be ripping open and revealing the very best books for Christmas. Meeting Raymond Briggs, creator of The Snowman and that very grumpy Father Christmas. Happy blooming Christmas to you too. And then we're going to find him fun in poetry with these six and seven year olds. Okay. Halfway down, he ripped his pants. <laughs> Discovering the special signature on this first edition of A Christmas Carol. And hearing a teenager's take on the Queen's queen. speech. She is uh, waiting for me to do a sexy time. Or <laughs> It's panto time. Oh, no, no it isn't. isn't. Oh, yes, it is. Here in Huntington is excitement as the audience arrive for tonight's performance of The Pied Piper of Hamden. Backstage, it's Bedlam. It's the cast of who is ready to stage this very traditional panto. It's taken years to prepare, but in less time, you could create something really special. Why not put on a panto at your school? They're fun, and they bring together the whole school, parents, and community. It uses all the elements of literacy, reading and writing, speaking and listening, and a lot more. Music, dance, design. Just pick a well-known story. Invent a few modern and local bits to put in it, and try a few traditional comic techniques like, he's behind you. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, no, he isn't. You could write some of it in rhyming couplets. Try writing some songs or adapting old ones. Put all that together and you've got yourself a show. Five minutes, gents. Five minutes. All right. All right. All right. We'll be seeing a lot more of the Pied Piper Panto later in the programme. We couldn't make a special Christmas edition of Reading Aloud without spending some time with my favourite writer of Christmas stories, Charles Dickens. Do you know, when he died, a market girl here in London said, Dickens? Dead? Then will Father Christmas die too? So where better to find out more about the great man's festive legacy than here at 48 Doughty Street in Bloomsbury, where Charles Dickens once lived. It was 1837, Charles Dickens was 25 when he moved in here with his wife and baby son, a rising literary star in a newly built house, now a museum. He wasn't here long before fame, fortune and a growing family led him to a bigger home. But of course he would have spent several Christmases here, sitting in this very chair, surrounded by friends and family, in this typical Victorian drawing room. And it could have been a washroom like this that might have inspired the story about Mrs Cratchit using a boiler or a copper to cook her Christmas pudding. Like a speckled cannonball, ignited with blazing brandy. And there'd be plenty of Christmas spirit of the alcoholic kind flowing from the wine cellar here in Doughty Street just as there is in A Christmas Carol. Large bowls of punch and Bob Cratchit's special cocktail of warm gin and herbs. Well, Dickens was certainly prolific while he lived here. He completed Oliver Twist, he wrote Nicholas Nickleby and part of Pickwick Papers. A Christmas Carol will come later, but this museum holds many fascinating items related to this magical story. 
I picked a few little treasures we've got today. Um, here is a copy of Christmas Carol that actually belonged to Dickens' father. In fact, you can see Dickens' father's signature there, John Dickens, at the top. Um, quite a nice little item because, as you can see, it's all blue and red. But when Dickens originally was given this copy, he was given it with green and red titles, which we associate with Christmas. He rejected it and went for blue and red. And tell me a bit about the picture. Who, who did that? Well, the illustrator was called John Leach. He was a friend of Dickens's, and um, you can see these lovely little hand-coloured paintings throughout the book. Um, cost a lot of money. In fact, Dickens didn't make much money through these. And what else have you got? Well, also another scene on this fan of Fezziwig and his wife dancing. This was actually painted by Dickens's daughter, who was born in this house. Again, a nice little Christmas item. There's the mistletoe again over, over Fezziwig and his wife. So she's copied this illustration, yes? That's right. She was an artist in her own right, a very interesting woman. In fact, she opened the museum in 1925. I think that the Christmas Carol story um, has a lot of elements that we associate now with Christmas. And um, Dickens sort of reinvented the, uh, the feeling of Christmas. During the period, um, the first Christmas card was sent as well, so a lot of the uh, customs that we have now starting with this, this little tale. And you've brought another book along? Well, Dickens didn't only write Christmas Carol, he wrote a number of other Christmas books as well. This is The Chimes, and um, I particularly like this one because Dickens has inscribed it to that other great writer, Hans Christian Andersen, who was a, a friend of his. Christmas is always a good time for selling books, and Charles Dickens certainly knew about that. Back in November 1843, he rushed to publish A Christmas Carol to reach the festive market. But he made a loss on the first print run in his effort to make it affordable for the working classes. Oh, hang on a minute, I better go and get that. How exciting! The lady bearing Hi. gifts is Julia Eccleshare, Lovely. the children's book critic. She's been busy reading the latest releases to pick the books she'd most like to see under the tree this Christmas. Well, I bought something for all ages, and I started with the um, very youngest, with a new book by Julia Donaldson and Axel Scheffler, who did The Gruffalo. The Tiddler is late for school, and of course there's a story as to why, and it's all the things that happen to him as to why he's late. Once there was a fish and his name was Tiddler. He wasn't much to look at with his plain grey scales, but Tiddler was a fish with a big imagination. He blew small bubbles, but he told tall tales. It's a great book about writing as well as a great story to read. I mean, it's a great book to share with a very young child, but I think it's a great classroom book as well because it's a spur to writing. And the next one? It's a wonderful idea. It's the adventures of the dish and the spoon, and of course it's a wonderful love affair. There's the dish and the spoon running away, and they go off and they have a wonderful time, and they float off to America. But then, of course, the dream turns, you know, terrible. It all goes wrong, and they end oh up dear. living in poverty. Well, they first they have the riches. It's the riches to, and then to the rags. This wonderful picture of the savage cutlery out to get them. Terrifying oh. stuff. It's about adversity, but it's also about how love sees you through. It's just a wonderful take on an old story, yes. um, giving it a new, you know, a new twist. And I think Minnie Gray is a fantastic illustrator. I mean, I think all her books have been wonderful. I know this is a very old favourite, Catherine Storr's Clever Polly and the Stupid Wolf, but I was brought up on this. We don't have enough short stories that are, you know, quick to get the whole of an episode. Very in. good for six and seven year olds. In very good for six and seven year olds. Very good for reading aloud to younger children. You can save the planet, a day in the life of your carbon footprint. It just does make you think about what you're doing. And if children don't start thinking about it very young, um, we're never going to make any changes. And it might even be useful for adults who don't know what a carbon footprint is. Are you talking of yourself? Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, it would tell you about your carbon footprint. But it makes you think what you're doing during the day. Very interestingly, given how much um, the adult world has taken on climate change, how little children's, you know, children's book writers have tackled the issue. There's very mm. little fiction about climate change and I just thought this was a really good book. Meg Rosoff's What I Was, it's a very powerful, very strange story about a boy at boarding school. It's about trying to find some freedom, trying to find some space and trying to find yourself. 
anybody who has experienced wanting to get out of a group and finding something on their own will just love this. Jenny Downham's Before I Die should be a really depressing book. I mean, if I tell you it's a story about a 17-year-old dying of cancer, you would think it was just kind of awful. And everyone I know has cried, even me, and I'm quite hard-hearted. Death straps me to the hospital bed, claws its way onto my chest, and sits there. I didn't know it would hurt this much. I didn't know that everything good that's ever happened in my life would be emptied out by it. I catch the weight of glances, nurse to doctor, doctor to dad. The hushed voices, panic spills from dad's throat. Not yet, not yet. It is incredibly moving and she decides she has to do various things before she dies. She has to try sex, she has to try drugs, she drives. She's never taken a driving test. That is a bit of a terrifying moment in the book. Actually, as, a, as an adult, you sort of think, I'm not sure I like this. Um, but it also explores what her younger brother's feeling, what her father's feeling, and it's just an incredibly sensitive novel. The thing about all of these, you know, when people get given a book, they always think, oh, a book, and it's kind of like not the most exciting present. But for, with all of these, they're the thing you will remember after Christmas, because when you go back and read it, it will last you far longer than those things. It's a kind of, oh my goodness, how wonderful. So Terrific great Terrific selection. Thanks ever so much. There's some wonderful seasonal poetry around, like this one by my old mate Ian McMillan. I keep my snowman in the freezer, just behind the pies. He likes it there, he told me so. I can see it in his eyes. Well, I've been sharing that one and a lot more besides with some of the children at St Albans Primary School. As children's laureate, I've become something of a poetry missionary, visiting schools all over the country. I want to do all I can to help parents, teachers and children enjoy poetry together. So instead of treating it as this rather cold stuff that we have to dissect, I'm trying to reconnect it with performance and pleasure. Dun, 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 dun. Well, look, hello, everybody. So my name's Michael, Michael Rosen. And I tell you what, shall we start with something very simple? Shall we start with our thumbs? Yeah. We do that. And then we're going to put your finger over there. Yeah. OK. Am I looking over there? No. And then we're going to look for your other thumb. That's probably going to be on your other hand. OK. And then you put that thumb on the end of that finger. And then you get that finger and put it on the end of your thumb. And you've got a window. No, 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 no. I know what it is. It's a telly. <laughs> tell you what, you could put your cheek on the telly. And that program is called Don't Be Cheeky. Don't be cheeky. I know, and you could put your nose on the telly. And that programme could be called, I know, Don't Be Nosy. No, 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 I've got it. No, it could be called that programme that comes on at six o'clock. The six o'clock nose. I think what they really love is doing the, the actions and also um, it was, I thought it was amazing how quickly they could pick up the poems. This is the hand that touched the frost that froze my tongue Ow! and made it go numb. This is the hand that cracked the nut that went in my mouth and never came out. Oh. <laughs> I often think poetry is a very physical thing, isn't it? It's physical because you can do actions with it, but also even rhyming and the rhythms of them, yeah. it's a very physical thing, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely. Something plastic, something drastic. My nose is made of plastic. Something plastic, something drastic. My ears are elastic. Something plastic, something drastic. I'm fantastic! I'm fantastic! Lovely. And now they're drawing me. This is quite scary.
Pantomime has never been so popular and still breaks box office records all over the country. Its origins can be traced back to the 16th century. And here in Nuneaton, they're putting on the Pied Piper of Hamelin, one of a dozen or so fables and folk stories that are drawn on for this Christmas tradition. Because at the heart of a good panto is a cracking good story. Down at number 36 lived Dorothy and Stan, who tried to kill a hundred rats with a frying pan. But every night, at least one bite, the rats ensured they made, until at last they got their sweet revenge and passed to them the play. In terms of writing the story, what we do is we'll always go back to the origins. So, for example, with the Pied Piper, just a ton of research, really, get as much information off the internet, from the library, on the original stories. But what can be done, I hear you cry, about this plague of rats? They surely know the answer is to fill the town with cats. But hold it. We then write our own story. We start from scratch. We, we try and take on board as many of the, of the original elements of the story. Um, and we can spend something like six to six to eight weeks just writing almost a plan, if you like, a synopsis, a storyline, an outline. This gown is made of cat! Mm. If the story is weak, I think people kind of tend to lose interest. The sooner we rid the town of rats, the sooner we can get back to normal around here. Oh, very well, Oppo. Sophie, in you come, my dear. Way past your bed, tiring of bags under your eyes. I'm coming, Father, I won't be long. I think it's a really important sort of uh, theatrical experience for most children um, and parents alike. It's one of those first sort of times that the, a child will go to the theatre. I think it's really quite magical. Um, the songs, the bright costumes, I think it's a really, really magical time. The dame forges this fantastic bridge between the, the audience and the stage. Shall I? I think that from a performer's point of view, it's very, very exciting. Some people find it very, very frightening, but I, I quite relish that, to be perfectly honest. Can this man deliver 100,000 filthy rats and send them down the river? Panto now offers pure family entertainment that caters for everybody from a six-year-old in, in the family to grandma, you know, and everyone can come and enjoy it as a family. What does Christmas mean to you? For many, it meant sitting down and watching the Queen's speech on TV. Not in my house, we were staunch Republicans. It's a royal tradition that began with a radio message 75 years ago that probably doesn't mean much to today's teenagers. But one school in Birmingham thought that it would be a perfect way to get their students thinking and writing about the year they've just had. What we're learning to do today is construct an alternative Christmas message, OK? We're going to be thinking really closely about our audience for the Christmas message and also the purpose of what we're doing. So did Christmas mean very much to your students before you began? In the school where I teach, the students are from a whole range of different cultures, so I wondered how much Christmas would mean to them. And when I asked them about that, it seemed to have significance for them. Even if it didn't have religious significance, they really saw it as a time for family and a time for celebrating the togetherness of their family in that way. I'm going to give everyone a very small piece of coloured paper, OK? And on that piece of coloured paper, I want you to write one key word that springs to mind when you think of Christmas. So just one word... They already had some of the key words in their mind and then they started to, started to develop that in more detail. So they wrote down three statements and then um, we shared those among the class. Christmas is a time when family gets together. Christmas is a time to reflect on past events. And Christmas is a time of giving and receiving. They started to reflect in more detail about that idea of kind of looking back and looking forward. So thinking about positive things about the year, things that they'd like to change about the year if they could travel back in time and also hopes for the year ahead. I changed the floods that happened in summer because well people are still homeless now and when we're going to be sitting at home in Christmas like celebrating with the family these people are going to be homeless and they won't have no way to celebrate Christmas. It was interesting how quickly the bigger issues came up that people weren't just thinking about their year personally they started to think about events in the news and I was you know I was pleasantly surprised how in touch they were with world events. 
they built on their debate in groups and they started to think about well what do I actually want to say to the UK on Christmas Day what do I want the content to be and at that stage I started to encourage them to think creatively and think well this is an alternative it might not just be a standard speech so it might be a rap it might be a poem it might be a performance do you want to hear the same old message with no variety no, no. I didn't think so. One of the poems that I gather was really quite emotional, quite a difficult area for this student to get into. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, am it was amazing, really, that she'd written such a reflective poem in such a short space of time, and it was just reflecting on the idea of thinking about um, people that you've lost during the year at Christmas time, and that it can be a sad time as well as a happy time. Those you love go high above, and on Christmas they come down encased in white snow. They come visit you when you feel alone. They tame the fire to dry your tears. They want to be there and make sure you're okay. They are by your side on that Christmas day when you feel most alone. They're always by your side. Oh. Looking back on it all, how would you sum up what you all got out of it? They had a chance to really reflect on some kind of moral and philosophical issues as well and just think about kind of the, the wider meaning of Christmas really. My name is Bob and, and it's a few laughs along the way too. Uh, me I come up from Kazakhstan and I have kidnapped your queen. She is uh, waiting for me to do a sexy time. <laughs> 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 of course it's not just pantomime that occupies the Christmas stage. Raymond Briggs' magical tale of a boy who befriends a snowman who comes to life is now a strong theatre favourite. And let's not forget that other Briggs creation, Grumpy Old Father Christmas. Blooming Christmas here again. Raymond Briggs rarely gives interviews and admits to being a bit grumpy himself. Happy Blooming Christmas to you too. So, rather tentatively, I asked him whether he ever gets fed up with being so closely tied to the gloriously bad-tempered Santa he created over 30 years ago. <laughs> no, I'm, I don't think I'm tied to Christmas. Um, some of the books I've done are associated with Christmas. Uh, Father Christmas, obviously, and The Snowman, of which in the book I don't think there's any mention of Christmas. But the film brought Christmas in. So have you got a favourite between those two books, Snowman and Father Christmas? I like the Father Christmas because it's very closely based on my mum and dad's home, the kitchen and everything, and the fact that he goes out delivering like my dad does, did, uh, in the cold and on his own. So I've got an affection for it for that. But the snowman was just a made-up thing, so I don't have tremendous feelings about it. What about Father Christmas? Is there part of you in that? I mean, have you written yourself into it? Well, other than the fact that he's terribly grumpy, which I am, most of the things one writes are autobiographical, unconsciously. Most of, a lot of my things are about a younger, fairly intelligent, middle-classy sort of boy with a father or another figure who's more working class, less educated. And yet they love one another, which is me and my dad, really. When you think of Father Christmas, you, you took a, a stereotype and then turned him into a, a, a real person. In a way, that was a pioneering sort of book, wasn't it? A lot of my things have this thing of Fungus, Bogeyman and Father Christmas, and they all start with the idea of having something utterly fantastical, like a Bogeyman, like Father Christmas, uh, and yet then assuming they are totally real. Father Christmas, let's say Father Christmas exists. What do we know about him? He, he, he's old, we know he's fat, we know he's been doing it for donkey's years. He must be fed up with it. <laughs> Appalling job, <laughs> going round the freezing cold at night, going down chimneys for God's sake, filthy, sooty, mucky thing, all alone, all night long. I mean, you can't think of a worse job. So he's bound to be immensely grumpy. I'm very glad to get home again. Thinking of The Snowman, in a way it's a very intimate book, isn't it? I, I mean, this is a boy who, you know, I think, in a way, is in love, isn't he? This is a moment of great emotion he has for this... For the for figure this, of man, the man, yes. ...that he's made. Yes. Yes, that's true. And I, somebody else pointed out that it's about death, really. Never occurred to me, but several critically people have said that because the snowman dies. 
and I did it a few years after my wife died. So there may be something in that. I didn't think of that at the time. Again, it was just being logical. A snowman exists, and let's assume he can fly because snow comes down out of the sky, so it's not a great stretch of imagination. Imagine him going back up in the sky again. And then in the end, he's got to melt and die, as we all have. So it had uh, some intimation of death in it, I think. Would you mind, do you think, being remembered for just Father Christmas and the snowman? Is that great a little bit with you? Because after oh, no. all, you've created so many wonderful No, no, wonderful I don't mind that at all. It's a great compliment that anyone remembers the stuff at all. Um, the thing I wanted on my gravestone is a thing our, my partner's granddaughter said at lunch one day, a bit of a silence fell on the lunch, when she was three years, six months old, looked across in the silence at me and said, Raymond is not a normal person, <laughs> which I thought was brilliant. <laughs> a little kid of three and a half saying the words person and normal, not, yes. not saying, oh, he's a funny old man. So I want that on my tombstone. Best compliment I've ever had. Brilliant. <laughs> Well, it's nearly time to bring down the curtain on this special edition of Reading Aloud. Just time for a side splitter I saved from my Christmas cracker. How would you describe someone who is afraid of Father Christmas? Claustrophobic. Bye. No, I'm, I don't think I'm tied to Christmas. Um, some of the books I've done are associated with Christmas. Uh, Father Christmas, obviously, and The Snowman, of which in the book I don't think there's any mention of Christmas. But the film brought Christmas in. I picked a few little treasures we've got today. Um, here is a copy of Christmas Carol that actually belonged to Dickens's father. In fact, you can see Dickens's father's signature there, John Dickens at the top. 
Um, quite a nice little item because, as you can see, it's all blue and red. But when Dickens originally was given this copy, he was given it with green and red titles, which we associate with Christmas. He rejected it and went for blue and red. And tell me a bit about the picture. Who, who did that? Well, the illustrator was called John Leach. He was a friend of Dickens's, and um, you can see these lovely little hand-coloured paintings throughout the book. Um, cost a lot of money. In fact, Dickens didn't make much money through these. And also, um, it was, I thought it was amazing how quickly they could pick up the poems. Mm -hmm. In terms of writing the story, what we do is we'll always go back to the origins. So, for example, with the Pied Piper, just a ton of research, really, get as much information off the internet, from the library, on the original stories. I think it's a really important sort of uh, theatrical experience for most children um, and parents alike. It's one of those first sort of times that a child will go to the theatre, and I think... In the school where I teach, the students are from a whole range of different cultures, so I wondered how much Christmas would mean to them. And when I asked them about that, it seemed to have significance for them, even if it didn't have religious significance. They really saw it as a time for family and a time for celebrating the togetherness of their family in that way. <laughs>